What's good, my dear language learning masters? Welcome to Natural Languages and welcome to a new interview of the Language Input Podcast. And today I'm going to have Jason on the show. Yeah. And well, he's American, but he's, um, he's a Gaelic teacher. Okay. And he, well, he started his career teaching Gaelic life in, in Scotland, but he's, he's been teaching online as well. And he's going to tell us about his experience living in, in Japan when he was a kid, in, in Germany, and traveling in Southeast Asia as well. So, you know, overall, like wonderful talk, uh, you know, about the power of, of languages and culture to, to connect, you know among people and you know and also ideas for language learning and so much more so i really hope to enjoy it and let's get right into today's episode let's go hi jason hey about it's um yeah it's impressive to have you on and it's been a while since since we met in France a few years ago. A few years, yeah. yeah I miss Ajem. I look forward to going back sometime. Yeah, you haven't gone back since, was it 2017, I believe? Yeah, yeah no, no. I, uh, oh, sorry, I did go back. Um, I was before the pandemic started. I forget which year it was, but yeah, the summer, I think before the pandemic started, I was over there and I was planning on traveling in Europe too, but uh, I had to cut it short. Okay. Yeah, it had been a few years. I was hoping to go to Ajahn every year, but then the, I, I took a year or two off. Okay. And then I went back and it was it's very nice. Very yeah. nice to be, to be back. Well, so yeah, so first of all, I usually just tell us a little bit about yourself, especially when it comes to languages, your experiences mm -hmm. as a language teacher, as a learner yourself, anything yeah. you have in mind. <laughs> sure, sure, sure. Yeah. So I was never really interested in languages, which makes my, my work kind of ironic, you know, it's a bit weird. Uh, I, I was always you know, interested in art. I, I minored in art in college and I, I enjoy history. I was always reading and I enjoyed old history, ancient cultures, mythology, that kind of thing, storytelling, old, old tales, folklore, all that kind of thing. Mm -hmm. Languages really weren't on my radar. And um, when I left high school, I was wondering what to do. And I, I decided to go a, a, a cultural route in history and literature, really. Um, up until then, I had had some experience with languages, like many Americans. You know, I had some some French in middle school and that kind of thing. And and then my my folks and I, my family moved uh, overseas. My parents are both they were both English teachers, and we moved to Japan for three years. Nice. And then we came back to Maine for two. And then we moved to Germany for two years to Berlin and came back after the two years. So in the middle of my, my school experience, I was in other countries and that was quite interesting. It was difficult, uh, you know, as a young kid to, you feel rooted in a place, you feel at home in a place and all of a sudden you're in this completely different culture and country and language. And mm. It was difficult for me at times, but it was also very good looking back on it. It was really important, I think. And I, for some reason, um, I have a, an, an interest in, just East Asian culture. And I think that was part of it, being immersed in it as a child and uh, just living in, in Japan. Kind of piqued my interest in that. I learned a bit of Japanese in school. You know, I picked up a little bit living there, just, you know, basic things. But again, I was a kid, you know, I didn't really need to ask for beer or the bathroom. You know, my parents <laughs> did that. So <laughs> that was my parents' job. So I was just kind of soak up a little Japanese and use a little bit, you know, when I could. Uh, I was just kind of observing, you know, experiencing being in another culture. And then when I was in Germany, I was a teenager. And I, again, I had German class and that was, that was okay. Um, but really I enjoyed using my German out and about, like going to the bakery, going to the movie theater, those kinds of things, using public transportation. I became fluent largely through just living there for two years. Mm. And I still consider myself fluent in German, although I haven't, gotten a whole lot of input to be honest so my German's very rusty I can understand like that however the speaking could use a little little practice um, right. but luckily some neighbors down the road they're 
they're Germans and they come over for dinner sometimes. So it's nice to hear them. I get a little input that way. Right. Um, but even after that experience, I wasn't really interested in languages. I, it was cool that I could speak German, you know, after being in Berlin. It was cool I had some Japanese, you know, but I didn't really care. Um, and so when I went to, to university, I, I went up to um, St. Francis Xavier University in Nova Scotia, up in Canada. And my family has this trend of kind of going other places. Mm -hmm. <laughs> we leave yeah. Maine every so often. <laughs> Yeah, my and then my mom moved to Madrid for seven years. So she was in Spain. You know, my dad was in India for a year and then in Germany again. So we we're all over the place. Wow. And I ended up in Canada and I studied um, Celtic studies. So that, like I said before, that was real, really focusing on history and literature, minored in studio art, which was nice. But as part of my degree, I needed to take a year of either Scottish or Irish language. And I thought Scottish Gaelic makes sense because this area is Scottish culture, you know, it's Scottish culture brought to Canada. Mm -hmm. And I thought I could connect with people with the history of the area. I could connect more with my studies that way too. And so I thought, okay, Scottish Gaelic, let's go for it, just a year. And it, I just fell in love with the language. I mean, our, our teacher would sing to us. She was, she won awards, at least one that I know of for her singing in national competitions in Scotland. You know, she was from Scotland and she had moved to Canada. So I had um, just a really wonderful experience. She really brought the language to life amongst all the grammar exercises and drills and, you know, difficulty of acquiring vocabulary. <laughs> it was really hard, but she did, she did bring a bit of magic to it. She would sing to right. us. She would tell us, you know, little stories mm. from, from Gaelic culture and Ga Scottish history and such. And I thought that actually that was kind of cool. It was a more living experience than... Um, than other language classes I'd had. But something about the sound just really, it went just really got into my heart. You know, I, I just fell in love with it very, very deeply, very quickly and struggled for, you know, years uh, trying to be able to speak a bit, you know, but still taking in the Gaelic and, you know, wrestling um, more traditional approaches to language teaching, but it was my love of Gaelic that really kept me going because there were times when I, I thought that, you know, I don't, I don't know if I can do this. You know, it was so challenging that perhaps I would be better, better to learn Icelandic. <laughs> and I'm glad I didn't. Hi. <laughs> and just ever since then, I've, Gaelic has become very much part of my life. It's added a lot of richness, a lot of you know, beauty and joy to my life and a lot of magic to my life. And I wanted to keep going with it. I didn't want it to just be something I did in college and then left when I became an adult. Mm -hmm. So I trained as a Scottish Gaelic teacher. So I'm a secondary, uh, I'm trained as a secondary teacher in Nova Scotia. So I do have a teaching license for middle and high school. And right after college, I did go and teach in Scotland for five years in a rural public school on the Isle of Isla. If, if you or if anyone watching knows your single malt whiskey, you know, Isla is a big name. Okay. And I lived near three of the biggest, biggest names in Isla whiskey. I lived near Lefroy, Legavillan and Ardbeck and I could walk to the distilleries and I got to know people in each one. That, that was kind of fun to live on a whiskey island. <laughs> uh, I was the, the Gaelic teacher for that island. Uh, there was only me. It was a small school, like a little over 200 students. And that was my first real teaching experience and experience, you know, being part of a community where there is still bits of Gaelic, you know, uh, I, I believe at one point Isla was 30% Gaelic, Gaelic speaking in to some degree. So most of my students, they weren't taught it by their parents. Like their parents didn't hand them down the language, but their grandparents still had it. It was their grandparents' first language. Okay. And that's a common story all over Scotland of my parents' generation not teaching Gaelic, not passing it along for many reasons. I mean, the history of Sc Scottish Gaelic and you know, the English language is challenging. You know, it's complicated. It's very bloody. It's heartbreaking at times. Okay. A lot of folk would have would be beaten in school for speaking Gaelic, for speaking their native language. And the, the, the British education system was very good at killing the desire to speak Gaelic. And it's, mm. people still hold that, those wounds to a degree. And it's still in the mindset, unfortunately. 
um, completely understandably too. You know, it was just how things unfolded, and that's what a lot of, a lot of, um, in my opinion, what a lot of the the work to be done is is, you know, having Gaelic be a positive experience. You know, like right, yeah, creating oh. more positive memories associated with Gaelic. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah, I was going to ask you about what it looks like right now when it comes to Gaelic. Like, uh, what's the percentage of people that still speak the language or is it just secondary to English in Scotland or do, do people still use it? Like, because, you know, I, I have no idea about that, to be honest. <laughs> so, and, yeah. What's, mm, what's the mm. landscape there when it comes to Gaelic? Mm. Yeah. Well, I've, I've been out of it for a few years. I, I left um, the Scottish education system mm -hmm. in 2017, 2018. So my, my knowledge is limited, but my experience and, and knowledge of it is that those who speak Gaelic have English too. So it, there's no pressing need for Gaelic, you know, for daily day-to-day -day -day life. Right. And that affects learning Gaelic and, you know, motivations to use it. However, there is still a lot of heartfelt connection to Gaelic. There's a lot of revival happening. It, Gaelic is really strongly promoted in many schools in Scotland. There are Gaelic immersion schools, Gaelic medium schools in, in the bigger cities. A lot of schools have uh, Gaelic immersion units. So they have a track of students that do all their lessons or as many as possible in Gaelic. Mm -hmm. And one of the big difficulties is finding a teacher who can, who is trained in teaching Gaelic, but also all the other subjects. So, you know, these, these are really great aspirations, but sometimes the, the reality doesn't, doesn't quite live up to it. And it's not saying it's anyone's fault, it's just the nature of it. You right. know, we, right. just, we need more Gaelic speaking teachers in like say art or in yeah, yeah. history, you know, music, that kind of thing. So a lot of work is being done to to encourage young folk to train as teachers to be able to share those subjects and, and teach them. Right. Uh, in terms of percentages, I'm not sure what the current number is. Um, last I heard, it was it's it's it was over a thousand, a thousand people in Scotland. At okay. one point, I think it was like sixteen hundred. Um, these are old old um, census numbers, though that from. Uh, 10 years ago so it's kind of hard to say what the what the present situation is like but i think there is more gallic than the census data shows okay. a lot of folks still have some words you know rattling in their mind that their parents used to say or their grandparents used or a song you know gallic is there just because they're not you know speaking gallic in their everyday life for everything mm -hmm. doesn't mean they don't have it which i right. think is an important important point you know, many, many, many Scots have Gaelic. It's just perhaps they're not conversational in it, mm -hmm. but it's still there. It's still yeah, there. still. But it's hard to hard to. So, sorry, go ahead. I, I was I was gonna say that there's still tales in Gaelic, right, and and stories. Mm -hmm. yeah. mm -hmm. Old stories, songs, especially anyone involved in the singing tradition, whether it's solo singing or in choirs, you know, they are very much taking up the Gaelic, which is wonderful. And it's even more wonderful when, when folk learn the words of what they're singing and, you know, the feelings behind the songs, the messages. Mm -hmm. And that, that's something I've, I've worked on with a few folk is, you know, what is this song actually saying? What's, what's being communicated so that they can bring more, bring that awareness into their singing and really, you know, connect with the feeling of the song it's really quite fun but yes many 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 people participate in Gaelic in some way even using place names so many place names in in Scotland are straight from Gaelic even in places where it's commonly thought there is no Gaelic well the places are named uh, that were named by Gaelic speakers so there was Gaelic at one point you know Gaelic was all over the country it's just for various reasons um, it's it's declined as a daily language. That being said, you know, in, in rural communities, especially in the islands, there's still a strong Gaelic community. Same with uh, Cape Breton in, in, in Canada. You know, these are living communities in Gaelic and they're really working hard to pass along this tradition, this language to the young folk so that it carries on. Because it has carried on despite all the 
all the work put into killing Gallic, you know, it's mm. remained alive and it's, it has continued to be passed down. And I, I think it's really important to, to, to help to support the Gallic community in doing that. Right. Certainly. So, so the, the but it's easy when you go to Scotland, you, sorry? No, go ahead, go ahead. <laughs> I'm sorry. I, I do this all the time with Zoom lessons. <laughs> There's a little bit of a delay, yeah, so right, right, I right. forget sometimes. Oh. <laughs> I get wrapped up in ways. Um, I was just going to say that when you go to Scotland, it's easy. It's easy to think that Gaelic is much more widespread because you see the road signs. Maybe you see um, other signs or names of places. You know, references that kind of thing. Um, but Gaelic as a as a day to day language, often often. Um, appears in more remote communities, more, more remote island communities and rural highland mm -hmm. communities, certainly, certainly. Yeah, like I, I was, I was going to ask about your students, like, uh, so those are the types of students you have, like people who want to, who want the language to, you know, go on and to pass it down to the, the new generation because it's, it's getting lost or, or just interested in the language itself or all kinds of people, really, especially with the, the first lockdown that happened. Mm -hmm. you know, people wanted, a lot of folk wanted a, uh, just a nice project to work on, to, to focus on, something else to, to focus on. And Scottish Gaelic was released on Duolingo, which made it very easy to access. Oh. So a lot of folk came across Scottish Gaelic. Maybe they have a connection to it, maybe they don't, but they just, they found it quite fun. Yeah. And they've, a lot of folk have carried on with it. You know, what started as a, a small project for lockdown became a passion for many folk. Um, on the other hand, you get folk who they know that Gaelic was in their family at one point and they want to bring it back. They mm -hmm. want to bring it back into kind of their generation, but also passed along to their kids. Um, a number of folk have children in Gaelic medium education and they want to support them in it. And they want to also understand what they're saying too. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, like little little ones yeah yeah so there are many reasons uh i i get a lot of emails from folk you know telling telling their motivations for it and it's just a wide range some folk really want gaelic to be stronger in scotland because they feel as a scot the language needs to be promoted mm -hmm. you know, it needs to be strong regardless of if you speak it or not it needs to be strong other folk just feel a very strong connection to it you know they might not be scottish they might not have any any family connection to it but they just love it that that's the category that i'm in you know i just fell deeply deeply in love with it for some reason you know and i i think it's worth worth hmm how to say it i think it's worth considering that maybe it's being remembered in someone as opposed to discovered Maybe we do have a connection to Scottish Gaelic that we didn't know about, that we're not aware of, and it, we're remembering it now. I'm not sure. Take, take, take that for, for, you know, take that however you want. <laughs> but there are many reasons why people are learning Gaelic these days. And it's really wonderful to see, you know, this, if I remember correctly, the Scottish Gaelic community jumped, of, well, of learners, I mean, it, the numbers jumped up by 10,000 with Duolingo. And that's huge for a minority language like this, for a yeah, endangered yeah. language. Like, that's really incredible. Yeah, it makes and there are difference. many native speakers offering. Oh, sorry, go ahead. No, that it makes a real difference. Yeah, <laughs> I think so. I think so. There are many native speakers offering great language classes, and you know, lots of group classes happening. I've started doing some group classes myself, and that's great fun. You know, I, I do a lot of one-on-one -on -one as well. Mm -hmm. And I also teach a university course for the University of Dundee in Scotland, okay. which is small group sessions. And then it's, it's an intensive program. So we, we have like weekly work that we go through, that kind of thing. Um, yeah, there are a lot of people who want to be able to speak a bit of Gaelic, especially if they go on holiday. You know, they want to go somewhere and just chat with someone a little bit. And that's really nice. One of my students in, in, in the Czech Republic in Prague, you know, she, her goal is to, she's going to go to Scotland. She loves going there and she wants to speak to a native speaker. She wants to chat a little bit with them in a pub, maybe over a pint or something like that. I thought, That's so cool. And she's going to do it. You know, she, <laughs> we've been working very hard since the pandemic started. And, you know, she's, her Gaelic has grown so much. 
I really look forward to hearing how it goes of when she is there experiencing that goal, you know, experiencing that connection with the with the native speaker and understanding yeah. them. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I was I was gonna say that that she she wants to experience a deeper level of connection with native mm. speakers. Yeah, that's great. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Now I understand your background, you know. <laughs> Your background and, and and it makes sense that you know since you you said that you loved mythology and tales and so on, it makes sense that you fell in love with Gaelic, right? Oh, it was the stories, the old stories, you know, of the heroes and that kind of thing. Oh, so much fun, so much fun. Yeah, I think it's it's a, it's a really important point because <clears throat> even for someone like yourself, that you said it that you wasn't particularly interested in languages at the beginning. But there's always, a, there's always a level of connection that makes you love language, whether, I mean, for most people it's being able to communicate with, with native speakers, right? That like the, the, the Czech um, woman that you were talking about, you know, to have a, a deeper feeling of, of um, connection with, with native speakers. But, you know, it, it can be just being able to, to understand stories and tales or just being able to watch native content because you're interested in it, even if you don't, I mean, for the most part, you want to be able to communicate, of course, that's like the ultimate goal. But even if just for that part of, you know, understanding a native, native content that you're generally interested in is, it's important, you know. I agree. There's a Gaelic, um... BBC channel, BBC Alapa, that has all sorts of programs on it, you know, everything you can imagine. And on it is one of the, one really popular, um, it's a drama program called Banan. And a lot of folk really love it. It's about, you know, people living in a small community, you know, the dynamics between folk. It's a bit of a soap opera. And it's really well done. I, I unfortunately haven't seen any because I can't access it because I'm outside of Scotland. So if anyone knows of a way to access BBC iPlayer, please let me know. I'd love to watch some. Um, oh, maybe it's on YouTube, actually. It might be on YouTube, bits of it. Um, but there are programs that that learners like to, to watch, and they understand bits. You know, it's it can be very motivating to be listening to or watching this drama program that is not specifically targeted at learners and to pick out bits. You know, yeah. folk do that with um, the radio station, too, Radio Nangale. Um, that's a very popular resource for folk because there's just interviews of all kinds of interesting people, music, you know, it's, it's a full radio program that they do, uh, that, that, that they carry on. And it's fun for learners to listen in. At first, it's like all noise. And then they start picking out words and they start picking out little bits and pieces. And like, like you said, engaging with native content, you know, yeah, yeah. Is, is really, it can be very motivating. And especially for for us folk over here in North America without much access to, uh, to a fluent speaker or a native speaker to talk to, right. you know, understanding what we hear and what we, what we see is really, it can really be wonderful. It can be very motivating. Yeah, yeah. and it's not, it's not that easy to find native content like it is with Spanish or French or, yeah, or German, right? Yeah. You're exactly right. Yeah. Yeah, but I, I, I feel that myself when, when I'm learning other languages, obviously, like I said, my ultimate goal is to be able to communicate with, with native speakers. But even when, when, when you get to a point in which you can understand native content, like I said, even if you're not communicating yet because you're not in, this, in the setting or you're not in the country or whatever, but that first step, is, it's, it's already great because it may sound cliche, but... Cliche, but it helps you understand the country, the culture, a lot more. Just, just you know, watching TV shows from from that specific country, or or just just listening to podcasts about you know topics that you're interested in, but who are related by native speakers. And I don't know. I just I feel so. I'm learning German and Russian now. Okay, so I hmm. I feel like. With German, for example, I feel more attracted towards Germany, not just to, to go there and live there, or, but to, to learning about the culture, about fairy tales and, you know, things of that nature. And like I said, mm -hmm. well, right now I, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm a beginner. So I'm, I, I've been doing it for nearly a year, I'd say. So I can understand quite a bit, but I, I can't communicate at all. 
<laughs> so, and again, my ultimate goal is to be able to communicate, right? That's what I want. But I'm I'm enjoying the process so much already because you know I, I can watch videos, most of them made by by comprehensible input teachers who you know mm -hmm. adjust to 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 the level that I need, right? But they're, they're talking about cultural aspects about Germany, about the history of the country, about you know fairy tales about the Green Brothers and things of that nature, and you know it's. It's, it's what I try to tell people. It's already a great fun to, to go through the process and be able to understand native resources, like I said. Obviously, the end, the end goal is to get to that point in which you can communicate. But, you know, it'll come. If you enjoy the process, if you're getting comprehensible input, it'll come. And yeah. It is, really, yeah. If you're not enjoying it, you're not going to continue with it after a while. Right. It's just too painful. It's not. That's you're your... not going to carry on with it for for good reason. That's how our minds work. You know, if something is too 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 much, just mm -hmm. it can be very difficult to to even want to do it anymore. Yeah, that's your your Japanese, right? <laughs> <laughs> oh, geez, my Japanese is very weak. Although although I have to admit, I sometimes I get the occasional word. I haven't thought about Japanese for a very long time. Oh, okay. I get a couple words, you know. Really. Yes, I, I was thinking about those two experiences, like first Japan mm -hmm. and then Germany that like you talked about. Because when you were in Japan, you were more like a kid, right? Yeah, yeah, I was like seven years old. And, eight, okay. Yeah. And you didn't, so did you go to school in an like international school in which you, it was yeah. English, right? Mm. Yeah, yeah, everything was in English. Right. And, and same when I lived in Berlin, I went to the John F. Kennedy Schule, which is um, it's international to a point, so it's German and and okay. and English, uh, and I did end up learning. Well, learning is a really not the word, but I ended up experiencing chemistry in German before I even had any, really much German. Wow. That was excruciating. <laughs> I, I find science already challenging to a degree, but right. to do it in a language you don't have yet, it's, wow. it was really painful. It was really awful. Um, and then I did it. I, I studied chemistry in high school in English in, in, here in Maine, and it was it was better. <laughs> it was better. Yeah, but yeah, yeah. yeah. It, was, it, it was. I was in a bubble, an English speaking bubble, right, to right. a degree. Although, in when I lived in Germany, I mean, all the all the the German kids who attended the school, they would speak German to each other. So I was always getting input. I was mm -hmm. always hearing something, and it was quite fun. The ads in the the movie theater. I, I, I would only go see English movies, but all the advertisements would be in German too. So right. I was always getting something, always getting some form of input, which is, yeah. which looking back was really wonderful because it felt natural. It didn't felt difficult. It never felt painful. Yeah. I mean, it's just, okay. Cool. <laughs> I could understand things and I could say some things and, you know, yeah. Yeah, you were, you were already a teenager, so you had more freedom when it comes to, you know, just walking around and, and you know, having relationships with, with friends and so on. You, so it was still a bubble, right? But you could sort of pop out of it at times, right? And yeah, absolutely. Like going, using public transportation, all that was all on my own. And it was really right. nice as a teenager to experience that, to do it in another language is really cool because things just made sense. All the, you know, just the different specific terminology used for the buses or the trains and that mm -hmm. kind of thing. It all clicked effortlessly. Right. Effortlessly. Yeah. And, I guess and part of it, I think, was because I wanted, because I wanted to travel, right? There was that strong motivation of, oh, okay, I kind of need to know what to do here. Yeah. Um, but I never consciously sat down and learned, you know, these are the train words. These are the bus words or anything like that. Right. I just picked them up by doing it. Yeah. Right. Yeah, that's exactly what I was thinking about. Uh, you were still young enough not to care too much about grammar and so on, right? <laughs> it was really hard learning all the, the definite articles in German, der, die, das. Oh, God. It's still challenging to me. I still have to think about it. I have to edit myself sometimes. <laughs> but yeah, it was very different, you know, learning in a classroom, the textbook versus being out on the bus. It right. Night and day. Night right. And day. Yeah, and... And when you were 
in, in the classroom, you're probably learning about other things in German, not about the German language itself, right? Am I, am I right? Hmm. Language and then also culture, history. Oh, so yeah. both, okay. Both, both. Yeah. Right. It was mainly a language class. It was, it was German for, you know, non-German speakers. Mm, okay. But okay. We, did, we did engage with the culture and history as well, yeah. But my subjects were, besides that course, my subjects were in English, besides that chemistry class. <laughs> so it was like real life, what really helped you out. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, that's, that's a great experience. So you've lived in Japan, Germany, Canada, America, of course. Any, <laughs> any other place that you've, you've lived? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I was in Thailand for a long time, in Thailand and Vietnam. Oh. I did some, when I left my, my teaching job in Scotland, I, I was nomadic for two years. So I just had my backpack and that was it. So I, I went you know, straight to Southeast Asia and had a, like a year of being in, in Southeast Asia during the winter time. So it, to my, to, to me, you know, I'm used to snow and ice and that kind of thing. It never got cold. It was never cold. Yeah. So it was really weird to be in a place where the winter was so different so warm for me. Um, I was very interested in, in culture. Yeah, I, I, and also about, about Buddhism as well. I am a practicing Buddhist and that's something I got into as I, as I left university and as I started teaching. So I wanted to be in a country where there's living Buddhist culture, where it's so widespread. So going to the temples in Thailand was so cool. And in Vietnam too. And, you know, get, getting some basic travel phrases so I could communicate. You know, Thai was far easier than Vietnamese. I, I tried my best with Vietnamese, but like the first, the first phrase I always learn is, you know, vegan or I'm vegan or I don't <laughs> eat meat or anything like that. And in Thailand, it was never a problem because there's the concept of a vegan meal, of a holy meal. I don't think I was saying it right in Vietnam because I, I, would, I, would, I was told later by a friend of mine that I would say, I'm a lemon. <laughs> I'm God, you know, I am all sorts of things, but vegan. Yeah, I never, <laughs> I rarely said that I was vegan. <laughs> and it was so different, the tones. It was the tones right, that right, was right. completely different from anything I had experienced, which was a fun challenge. It was all of a sudden I had to listen for things that I had never listened before. And I found that really quite fun. <laughs> and I did find Thai much, much straight, more straightforward. You know, I got the, um, the Michael Thomas method, you know, the, the, those audio clips of um, where it's kind of, it's repetitive and kind of conversational and you hear a lot. Uh, it's re listening centric. I was learning Thai that way too. And that was, that was quite fun. I could, I could understand the announcements on the trains in Bangkok after yeah. doing a bit of that course, you know, little things that were, that were kind of made things more, more fun linguistically. Uh, but I was, I was a tourist first of all. And then I came back to Thailand as a teacher. I taught English as a second language using CI. So I used all my Gallic techniques I have. I just put them all for English and it, it worked. I mean, it was, it was very different <laughs> in a different feel for me, but it, it, it all worked great. Um, and I was at a Buddhist wisdom school out in the jungle about uh, three hours north of, of Bangkok. I was near a, a national park. Yeah, so that was, that was interesting. Uh, living at the school, being an English teacher being in Thailand for, you know, half a year, yeah. as opposed to just being a tourist, going to all the places where people want to speak English to you, or, right, you right. know, you just need your basic Thai. It mm -hmm. was really, it was quite an experience. It was really wonderful. I, I find, I find um, Asian, Asian culture and history so interesting. And my students, my Thai students shared so much about it. It was really just fascinating to talk to them and listen to them. And same in Vietnam when I was, you know, um, teaching a bit of English down there informally, you know, the friends of the, the English teaching center would tell me more about Vietnam and the history and the language. And it was, it was so rich. It was so fun mm -hmm. to be in the country and to be learning these things, you know, being a student again, student right. of my surroundings. It was so much fun. Yeah. It was also nice to be in, a, in another country, to a place I hadn't been before. That was kind yeah. of exciting. Nice. Yeah, I'm. I'm sensing a theme here, Jason. Like uh, <laughs> you get you get interested in the culture and so on, and that's what attracts you to the language. Actually, so yeah, I think that that can be useful for a lot of people who, mm. you know, they you can always find a gate 
to to you know towards the language or or the culture. Mm -hmm. In your case, it's culture. I, I'm really attracted by that as well. Like I said, with German or Russian or other languages, that. But it might. Well, I, I'm not really sure if it's if you're interested by the culture first, so you get into the language, or the other way around, but, or or a combination of both, right? But I've I've seen it with. So, for example, with German, hmm. I started learning because, first of all, I love the process of learning a new language, whatever it is. Then it's still European language with things in common with English. So I thought I could get I could get access to comprehensible input almost right away, which makes it easier than Thai or Vietnamese, for example, right? <laughs> But then I, I, I noticed that I, I started to get more and more interested in the culture afterwards, right? Mm. I wasn't necessarily interested in, I mean, I, I'm in getting to know other people from different, I, I'm, I, I love that in general, right? But I wasn't especially interested in German culture specifically more than others, but because I started getting into the language, I started getting more and more interested in, in, you know, in knowing about the different cities, their history and things like that. Not, not just the, 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 the period that we all, we all know about when it comes to Germany, right? <laughs> so, yeah. Mm. So. Mm. That's a very good point. Yeah. I, I did, you know, there are little, little interesting things that come up as we learn. It's not just language. It's not just words and phrases and all that. It's it's you know a, a doorway into the the culture and things will find us about the culture that can be can be really fun yeah yeah and then I've noticed like your your relationship with other people like I mean of course like I'm, if you're I was gonna say if you're an asshole it, it doesn't really make a difference but no. <laughs> just kidding just, but what I mean no, is it doesn't <laughs> what I mean is once you start learning the language like I said you get more interested in the culture. But then your connection with native speakers is deeper as well. And you get more, I don't know, it, it might be my personality as well, but I, I, I don't know, I find people more friendly when, when I'm genuinely interested in their culture, they're more open to, to, to talk about anything and they, they feel the connection. Like to, to give you an example, I, I've seen it many times, like because I love all that, like languages, other cultures and so on. I, I also love geography in general, like knowing where ev everything is, uh, here's a mountain, things like that. So many times I'm, you know, I'm different situations. I'm meeting people from different countries and they tell me where they're from or I try to ask where they're from. And so I, I tell them about cities in their country or their specific place where they live that nobody, I mean, almost nobody knows about in their you know, everyday life. So that I immediately feel that connection. Like they they mm. they like me right away. And like I said, if after that you're an asshole, it is it doesn't matter, right? But you know, I, I tend to think I'm not. <laughs> Just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> but it's like that first level of connection that really makes a difference. I remember yeah, and, and you don't need to go as far as as a remote country when it comes to your own. I remember meeting it was uh, in a party, I was talking to a French guy and he was from, so he's French, you know, it's like my neighbor country, like as a Spanish person. He, he, he said he was, I, I don't remember the city, but I knew it was in Brittany, like Northwest. So when he told me where, where he was from, I told him, oh, so in Brittany in that part. And he was like, wow, you're the first person that knows. <laughs> yeah. So there's like that first, you know, level of connection that you can fake it, you know? <laughs> mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So he could see I, that I was generally interested, right? And yeah, I just love that. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It's true. It, it can really connect you to someone, even just a little bit, right? You don't need to be completely fluent in something to, uh, to appreciate someone else's culture. When I get emails from people and they say where they're from, I try to respond. I even just say hello in their language back when I write them back, you know, little things like that. Right. It's true. It can be so much fun as we absorb bits of languages as, as we live and to, to use them 
just spontaneously when around folk who, who, who speak that language. Like I have a, a, a Spanish phrase or two or you know, a French phrase or two just you know, ready in my mind and just to use them, it, it can be very surprising, but kind of fun too. It's, sure. it, it gives me a way to kind of connect with someone as well as, as a, be, beyond just you know, speaking mm -hmm. English. Mm -hmm. to them. Yeah, beyond kind of who we are already. It's, right. uh, I think it's a really nice way to, to appreciate someone. Yeah, I, I, I'm sure you felt it yourself. Like when, for example, when you were traveling in Asia or when you lived, in, I mean, in Japan, you were a kid, but, or in Germany, like, did, did you feel that within yourself when, when somebody knew where Maine was, for example? Because Maine, <laughs> let's say, it's not New York or LA, right? No. So no. <laughs> when, when you tell, I, I'm from Maine. Did, did mm. you feel that? Like when someone knew, you were like, hmm, so you, instantly you you felt more attracted to that person right it did feel nice yeah i i felt i felt more seen certainly by them more appreciated yeah, yeah that's true in 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 vietnam you know going going to um being in hanoi and you know meeting other westerners occasionally you'd meet people from you know up this way not not maine particularly but not far away like usually new york or the, or massachusetts you know and some you're right someone who knew oh you're from maine okay i know maine or maybe they knew my hometown you know that kind of thing it, mm. it does kind of feel nice it's yeah. yeah yeah even if subconsciously like you you feel more connected to to that person and i, I feel that myself at times because i'm from a small town in the north of spain so when when i tell people that i'm from spain it's always madrid barcelona you know and I understand, I'm, I'm totally fine with it, you know, but the, the occasional person that says, oh, sorry, yeah. so in, in that region, in the, in the north center, oh yeah. So, you know, that immediate connection, you know, it happens. All right, so, and how about your, your classes? So you, you use CI, obviously, right? Comprehensive input, but so, mm -hmm. How do you go about it? Like, do you use stories? Mm. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, <laughs> Yeah, it it depends who I'm who I'm working with. You know, some folk like to do stories. Some folk like to just chat. You know, okay. and that's fine. You know, a big part of it is knowing who's who's in the video call with me. So I've been doing this virtual style learning for years. I started it when I was actually um, in my last year in, in Scotland. So I was kind of playing around with it. So when the pandemic hit, it was just business as usual for me. It was nothing different. Just all of a sudden, there are more people wanting to have lessons, which is great. Yeah. Yeah. Um, it, it, it really depends. You know, a lot of folk, um, a lot of folk work with Duolingo a bit. Maybe they watch some YouTube videos. Maybe they watch my YouTube videos or do, you know, one of my online courses, like my, excuse me, my Gaelic Foundations course, which really builds up their, their vocabulary and, you know, their comfortability. And then they, at some point they want to speak. So usually just keep it all about them and knowing a bit more about them, what they're open to. Mm. I, I really love working with pictures. Most people really love, you know, exploring pictures. It's, it's quite fun. E even if they're, you know, not really interested in being, you know, creative, wacky stories, we can appreciate a picture together. So, you know, talking about the features of the picture. I have the Highlands right here, Highlands of Scotland here. So talking, I mean, heck, we could talk about the weather. We could talk about height. We could talk about, you know, what adjectives we could use to talk about this place, like craggy, you know, <laughs> rough, that kind of thing, you know, stormy, and then comparing it to their own place. What, what, are, what is your town like? What is, okay. so a lot of it's conversational in this way, uh, just kind of PQA style, really. Um, and sometimes if someone expresses, you know, interest in in being uh, like creative in a fantastical way, finding an interesting picture of like a dragon on, on Google or something kind of fantastical. And then, okay, so we're gonna talk about the picture and doing a picture talk, I think it's, I, I haven't kept up with the names of the techniques, but yeah. you know, starting yeah. with the picture itself, appreciating it, naming it, you know, talking about the character's background and then we can go into a story. You know, I've, I've done mm -hmm. that a bunch too. That's really fun. Um, some folk really want to to learn a song, so they bring me a song, or they or I suggest a song. And what what, what we do is we PQA the song. So we have like each line, and we go through what it means, and then we kind of you know ask I ask them some questions about the line and all, and compare it to them. 
So like if, for example, if the sailor is, you know, he's thinking about being back home, he can't wait to be back home with his beloved. And I think, okay, you know, the sailor's on his boat at sea, you know, where are you right now? Are you on a boat? Do you like boats? Would you go sailing? You know, what would you think if you were in this sailor's position, if you were in his shoes, that kind of thing. So PQAing the song lyrics, which is, that's sure. really fun. And then drawing them too. You know, drawing them out. This is the boat on the waves. These are the three giant waves, that kind of thing. And just really having fun with the words of the song. And it happens to be a song so that it's more memorable for them. Right. I like doing that kind of thing for sure. Um, really, it's it depends on the, the, the student and what really what really brings them to life. You know, what, what helps them immerse in the language the most and i try to do that as much as possible and you know sometimes folk um oh one of my one of my students she she writes sometimes writes diary entries for me it's like okay well what did you do this week so we go over okay you did this and chat a bit about it pqa it a little bit you know and then i talk about you know this is what i did this week and da, 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 da. that's kind of nice and maybe you know someone goes on holiday they take pictures so we talk about their holiday pictures Mm -hmm. and doing a picture talk that way which is fun um i I've, I've written uh i've written comprehensible readings about a lot of things like characters in gallic folklore like various creatures or places or you know landmarks in like ha have you have you um seen that the horse in england the white horse the chalk horse on the hill in england the mm. Uffington White Horse. No. Uh, I Google it. It's really, it's really cool. Okay. And just talking about this is an ancient horse picture. And, <laughs> and I make like a reading about it, like kind of like a news article with a picture and a little caption, you know, tailoring the language to a certain level, like if they're more foundational or, you know, a bit more advanced. And then we can, you know, that's maybe they want to read that on their own and we read it together. And then, you know, asking questions about it and like, and then PQA based on that news article. Like, okay, well, are there any like big pictures like this where you are? Any landmarks that are interesting? Anything special in mm. your town? And we can look on Google and we can take a look and do another picture talk about, okay, and compare them. Well, this, this chalk horse is like massive. It's on a hill. This landmark, you know, the statue is on a hill too, but it's small, like... It's yeah. and like the possibilities are just endless. Yeah. It's so much fun to work with pictures. And because virtual because teaching virtually is limited to a degree, I find pictures are really a just a effortless way to really build up the input and just yeah. learn more about the student too. You know, it's many times in my lessons it's remarkable because it's we're actually just chatting. We're having a conversation. It happens to be in Gaelic, mm -hmm. which is fun. But really, it's about the human connection. Yeah, you know, what, what the they're two. interested in, and they pick up a lot of Gaelic in the along the way. Yeah, yeah, that's that's the key. Yeah, yeah. I was thinking that in the end, it, it, it comes down to some sort of storytelling, whether that's their own lives, of folklore and old tales, and then, which is the most important thing to me, is your you're telling a story or you're, you're chatting about the land, whatever it is. And the chat or the story happens to be in the language they want to learn, but the, the interest or the focus is on the story itself or, or the connection, you know, the game, whatever it is. So that, that's the key to me to sort of take your attention away from the language itself and, and focus on the story. And that's why stories are so great because, you know, they. Hmm. They they immerse you in in you know in a fantasy world. If you're talking fantasy or or they're, if they're, you're talking about their pictures on vacation, they're remembering their vacation, right? So they kind of forget that they're listening to a different language. That's that's the key to me because you're gonna love the process that way, <laughs> and it's gonna work. Yeah. Absolutely, it's it's most meaningful to them. Cool, cool. That that's a real key ingredient in, in immersion is you know something that they're very willing to engage with you know on a deep level. And one thing I found is we're working virtually like this I'll, and working in a non-targeted way. That was kind of the the way I was exploring um, 
a few years ago and just kind of seeing what I can do with that and mm. seeing what other folk are doing with it. And in a non-targeted way, there's always this, there's always the seed of something really interesting in a lesson. And I just, I listen to every word they say, how they say it, if they get really excited about something, that's what we should focus on. That's what we should get the picture of and talk about. That's what we should, you know, learn more about. That's what I want to hear about. Cause then they're just gonna, you know, come alive. If someone wants to talk about their, their, their kid, great, you know, sure. But I, I found there's always a seed of something and kind of the first part of a lesson is chatting like, how's it going? What's the weather like, you know, how was your week? I'm, I'm looking for that seed. I'm looking for, you know, what that person really wants to talk about based on their body language and, you know, what I know of them. And sometimes it takes a little while to emerge, but when it does, that's like you just said, you, you get yeah. so immersed in it and you go into story mode with that. You know, it's, it's really wonderful. Like all of our students have so many things that they, they can share with us. So many wonderful, um, wonderful directions to go in a lesson. And, and one thing that I've worked really hard on is letting go of being a teacher so much and just, okay, we're going to talk about the beach now, <laughs> or we're going to talk about the dog. Yeah, let's talk about that dog, that happy dog with the ball in his mouth. I'm going to talk about this dog and compare them and, oh, let's talk about your dog. And heck, I mean, I've done that. I've done hour lessons talking about dogs, things like that. <laughs> Lord of the Rings. We talked about all the characters in Lord of the Rings. <laughs> it was just that for an hour it was fun it was and it was what he wanted to talk about and the, the art is you know making it clear so that you don't break the spell right you don't mm -hmm. jerk them out of that 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 immersion but it's yeah, really yeah. It's, it's it's amazing how this can work virtually i thought this could only really work in person and i think it is best in person but it certainly can work virtually have you experienced that yourself alvaro yeah, yeah. I mean, like, my uh, all my students are online students, so <laughs> yeah, I I understand it can be challenging with kids because they need to move around and so on. But with adults, that we can sit down for an hour, you know, with no problem, it just it works. Just I mean, just as well. I was gonna say, but yeah, you miss that connection part in person, but can total work. Yeah. And I was thinking, uh, you know, the dogs and a lot of the risk actor you were talking about, it's just stories, again, stories. And stories, that's, yeah. that's the way we communicate on a daily basis, right? So we, whether we're talking about ourselves, most of the time, no, just kidding, <laughs> or, or other stories, you know, so we're just, we're just telling stories one way or another. That's yeah. why it's so interesting. I agree wholeheartedly. That's why stories on social media are so interesting to people mm. right on instagram and tiktok that's why they're so popular is folk right. everyone loves a good story is the art is finding what's what's the most interesting story happening in this lesson you know what could mm -hmm. what could we do yeah. yeah i i agree i love stories i love history and just kind of the story of someone's day too it can be really nice yeah but stories everywhere stories everywhere yeah and how are you as a as a student yourself are you looking to learn any language right now or learning any language hmm. i'd like to um I, i'm focusing so much on gaelic that i don't really learn a whole lot um but i would like to to sharpen my german more i'd like to be more precise uh, and, and have my german be closer to that of a native speaker uh, i would also love to learn the scandinavian languages mm. i would love to spend some time mm. up there up in norway sweden finland and speak to people probably in very simple ways and probably their English will be better than mine, but to, you know, communicate with them, like we were saying before, even just a little bit yeah. and just really may, maybe working on some farms up there or something and learning how does one talk about farming in Norwegian <laughs> or something like that, you know, to, but as a way to, to spend time up there with folk for a while and, and to learn in an immersive way, just real from folk. Um, mm -hmm. I, I was learning Swedish at one point using the again the michael thomas method which since it's so you know listening centric I, I found it useful it's there are certain limitations to it and if there are any ci teachers of norwegian finnish or uh, swedish i would love to learn from you i would absolutely love i will train you i'll train you how to do this i'm a coach in these <laughs> techniques i'll train you so you can teach me <laughs> and pay you too uh, 
and I'm not kidding about that. I would actually love that. <laughs> That's the thing about this CI work, right? It's there are some languages out there that maybe we don't know of a teacher who does that does it this way, and we really want to to learn it this way. Um, but yeah, I would love to learn the Scandinavian languages more, and um, yeah. Italian as well. My yeah. my grandmother came from Milan, and my great grandmother, you know, only spoke Italian. So I would love to learn the, the the Milan dialect to really get really good at, at, at Milan Italian and then go there again, just kind of be there, be a, be a, a you know, a local to, to a degree for a while and just experience maybe what my family did, you know, a couple generations back, but in Italian, I don't want to go there and be, you know, American guy. Yeah. <laughs> one day, one day. Um, yeah, I, I, I do have a couple language goals um I, I i'd like to to learn a bit more um yeah certainly certainly yeah even when with languages that are not as popular all it takes is an early speaker who's willing to learn the technique right like you said <laughs> cool Absolutely. yeah I, I i i bet you you love all biking stories as well. Since you're, you're talking oh, yeah. about, when, when you said Scandinavian countries, my mind went immediately to <laughs> biking stories. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I'd love to do a video series on my YouTube channel about sagas, the Norse sagas. And okay. I mean, it's Viking history is very much connected to Scotland. Scotland is very present in Norse history. Right. So it's it's a natural fit. And and my intermediate course that I did, the, my online video course, had a lot about the, the, the Norse when they came over and how the culture changed when the Norse came. Uh, that was really fun. I was reading a lot of historical books and then, you know, crafting ways of talking about it in a straightforward way in a video mm. and then teaching the history through Gaelic. And I'd love to do more of that. Oh yeah, oh yeah, the Norse oh, yeah. sagas, <laughs> Norse folklore fascinating stuff so cool so yeah cool. Um, yeah i leave the links to your channel and everything you want me to oh, link to thank in, you in, in the description mm -hmm. also i was thinking about that one of the channels uh, i've been following f to improve my german is is a, um, a german teacher i actually had her on the podcast anna her channel is oh. called comprehensible german oh. and she talks a lot about culture and tradition and things like that, but she, she has specific playlists about Norse um, mythology, about Odin mm. and Thor and so on. So I, I just thought about that as, as you were talking about it. Cool. cool. That, Thanks that for might, the tip. I'll definitely check that out. That might be fun for yeah. you. Yeah. <laughs> Comprehensible podcasts are really invaluable. They're just so yeah. easy to access. Put them on in the background while you do something else. It's, oh, it's such a gift. Yeah. Yeah, in this case, is the, their YouTube videos because she uses a lot of pictures, like back to your point, mm. and, and so on. And yeah. Oh, even better. Yeah. I'm, I'm <laughs> very visual. Right. Yeah. Great. So that's, that's probably going to be helpful as you, you know, polish up your German a little bit. <laughs> <laughs> bit by bit. Cool. So, yeah. So, it's, I mean, you kind of, answer so that already so if you if you were to start a new language like the scandinavian languages that you were talking about mm. the first thing you go to would, would be just like a native teacher who uses comprehensible input right yeah mm. yeah and i've heard of i've heard of folk who want to learn a language with a native speaker but that they're not trained in ci so they actually teach them a bit of ci like mm -hmm. this is how i would like to be taught if you're willing right. and they end up training the teacher to um, in CI techniques, which I right. think would be fun. I'd like to try that sometime if there's any, any, any um, Scandinav Scandinavian language speakers out there who are willing to, to, to learn this style of teaching a bit. I would, I would think that'd be so much fun. That'd yeah, so much fun. I mean, it, it, there's more to it, but in the end, you know, mm. come to, to being comprehensible. Right, <laughs> like if yep. if if, yep. if you if you communicate in a way that the other person understands what you're saying, it's working. Obviously, back to your point, you try to find that they're interested in, so so it's also fun, right? But at, at the end of the day, you can use pretty much any type of real life scenario, because for example, I'm using board games a lot recently. For example, ooh, I want to do that too. 
because back to your point about being visual, there's a lot of things that you understand because of it. Like, you know, I'm moving this meeple around because my strategy is to sort of, you know, whatever it is. Mm-hmm. But mm-hmm. You, you, you listen to the specific words, the specific actions, but in your mind, you're trying to learn the game, you're trying to win. <laughs> and, and, and you're actually seeing the other person move the meeple around or roll the dice, whatever the action. And again, it's super fun, right? So it's there's so many real life scenarios, situations that you can use in order to teach the language. It's it's all about making it comprehensible for the other person. That's it. Easier said than done, especially at the beginning. <laughs> yes. But yes. That's all it comes down to, right? It's not something crazier than that, right? No, it's just you know, like you said, everything is clear, and you make it clear. Oh. that's what we do <laughs> we make things clear <laughs> so, uh, yeah we're just thinking so the, there's um, an online platform that i use for board games it's called board game arena Ooh. it's really good because i'm just wondering if they have gaelic <laughs> as well i doubt it i highly yeah. doubt it but right right because you can mm. change the language and the whole not just the platform but the the games the mm. the, the language changes right so if you're, you're, you're teaching French, you can just change it to French. So all the game, all, all the little things, the cards, if, if there are cards, are in French. So it's great. But yeah, I was thinking probably not in Gaelic. <laughs> not yet. You never know. Yeah. There, there still are a lot of things that are translated. Right. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I mean, I'm not sure to be honest, because there, there's a lot of languages. And, you know, even if this is not there, a lot of the games, games with no cards, for example, you just need to know the game yourself to be able to explain it to other people. So this mm-hmm. is not language dependent, right? Right. So, right. Yeah, but, and I suppose a, a board game, if it's straightforward enough, you could kind of give a quick rundown in English in the, tar- in the L1 beforehand. It just So everyone kind of has a sense of what they're doing so they don't feel completely overwhelmed. Yeah, it, all, I mean... We're moving I, around the board and going here. It's like, okay, great. Yeah. Now it's in Gaelic. <laughs> right, right, right. Yeah. yeah, I mean, obviously it depends on, on your student's level. Yes, yeah, yeah, certainly. With, with certainly. Spanish, for example, because of the similarities, I can, mm. unless it's someone who's really starting from scratch, I, I can always explain the game in Spanish, in the target mm. language. Because that's that's ex, extra input for them, right? Because they're they're learning to they're, again they're interested in in really learning to 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 learn I mean in really learning how to play the game because they want to win <laughs> yeah and have fun so so again I'm using Spanish but they're focusing on on understanding the game so they kind of forget that I'm actually using Spanish to to teach the game and then of course because yeah. I'm we're using my screen then I ask them so do you want to move it here or here or do you want to uh, here on top, here at the bottom left, right? You want to buy a product for two gold, you know, whatever the, <laughs> the context, right? Hmm. So you're, you're like the DM, right? You're the, you're the dungeon master telling them what's going on. Sort of, yeah. In Spanish. Yeah. yeah. That's SM, Spanish master. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Cool. That sounds like fun. That's, I'd like to, to experiment around with board games and yeah things like that that'd be really fun yeah. it's fun it is fun yeah. yeah even better if it was in person right when when one day when when we can all yeah. have in-person lessons you know without any shred of worry you know yeah yeah that'd be yeah. nice yeah but again that's another thing that i, I like my myself that like this is like the full circle i explained mm. so i, I want to learn how to play the game in order to be able mm. to teach my students right so what, what I'll do sometimes is I, I watch a tutorial on YouTube in the language that I'm learning right now. <laughs> Ooh, so, cool. So, you know, I, I, I watch the tutorial in, say, Italian, because yeah. I, I speak Italian, but so in Italian, I can understand 100% of it, right? So, because yeah, yeah, yeah. if, if I watch the tutorial in German, I wouldn't understand <laughs> what, I, what I need to do, right? Or little pieces, but in Italian or Portuguese or French, I can so I, I watch the tutorial in that language, so it helps me get input. <laughs> and then I explain it in Spanish, so it has, helps my students get, get input. Cool. So full circle. <laughs> Very much so. 
Yeah. Oh, that's so neat. And there's even like, now as, as, a, as a student myself, there are a lot of YouTube channels that talk about um, board games or games in general. And, and if, you, if you get to like RPGs, like role playing games, that they, they, they create stories. So it's like, it's part storytelling, part board game. So I use that myself as a language student. Mm. So cool. Yeah. It's <laughs> so a, a, cool. some random ideas that are, you know, going through my mind yeah. right now. <laughs> oh yeah. Oh, Gallic would be perfect for a role playing game in a kind of pseudo medieval setting. It's got all the words for everything you could ever right, do. Right. And that kind of thing. Yeah, that'd be so cool. <laughs> I've, I've heard that kind of informally there have been Dungeons and Dragons groups in Gallic. Um, I think at Glasgow University, they had a, a D&D club. I'm not sure if it's still running or, you know, how, how many sessions they had, but the, the sheer idea, you know, the, the sheer coolness of that idea, just, oh, I love that. <laughs> awesome. that's, yeah, that's one thing that I found is on social media, Gallic is brought into a lot of kind of a lot of things that we do these days. So there are a lot of... Um, Okay, I, I'm really not up to date with, you know, a lot of social media things, but I've, I've heard and I've seen, you know, folk are making all sorts of videos. There's a lot of TikTok folk doing things in Gaelic, a lot of native speakers on Instagram too. And it's interesting how they're bringing this, you know, ancient, ancient yet modern language into these platforms and doing yeah. things kind of like what you're mentioning, you know, they're, they're pushing the boundaries of what can be done. And it's so cool. It's so wonderful to see. Yeah, there's, there's, I mean, this has nothing to do with languages, but there's a lot of great things you can take from social media and people sharing things. Because, like, you know, we people shit on social media, on social media a lot. And I kind of understand some part of it, right? But, you know, the amount of knowledge and resources that you, that we all have access to because people are just creating content and, you know, you, you have to sort your way through a lot of things, but <laughs> in the end, you know, there's, to me, it's, it's, it's just a blessing because there's so many things that I have access to, so many crafts that I can learn and skills and languages and it's just, to me, it's just unbelievable, but <laughs> I understand the potential dark side of it but if you know how to use it to me it's a huge huge plus you know mm. it's like anything Every, everything yeah, can yeah, have a dark right. side right everything can be misused yeah it's a tool yeah, um, yeah, yeah so. i agree i yeah. agree all right so that was that was wonderful jason any any other thing that you wanted to touch on that we forgot um It's a good, good old talk, um, but comprehensive. Yeah, it's good. good chat. Chat. <laughs> what one thing that I've been exploring is uh, writing easy readers. Like you, know, you know yourself, the TPRS readers and the CI novels, they're just abound. There's so many of them. Mm -hmm. But for a language like Gaelic, there's nothing like this. Right. You know, there are books written for learners. At the same time, it's in from what I've heard from many learners, it's hard to get immersed in them. Like, like you were saying before, getting into the story, like in the flow. <laughs> so I've been, I've been working on some myself. I've, I've, I wrote uh, my first book, Rona Agus Machodrim here, about a traditional story. And it was written very much for, um, for, I don't like to say beginners, you know, folks who are still building their foundation, yeah. complete with, you know, picture, pictures and mm -hmm. stuff. You know, they're very lovely, nice. very lovely presentation. My publisher did a great job, and with a um, with a glossary in the back, so that you can look words up specifically for this book in this book. You don't need to turn to another dictionary, and that's been really fun. That's been an extension, I suppose, of the storytelling, yeah. and it's really wonderful to see folk say that I've read my first Gaelic book, and it's a real book. You know, it's not spot the dog has a birthday party it's not some <laughs> children's book it's a real book yeah and there's you know, maybe there's even an emotional connection to the characters they f the reader feels something from this you know straightforward uh clear book and that's one thing i do do on my online lessons sometimes we read you know a chapter from 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 this and then you know pqa from it or compare things i do all kinds of things based on the the, the book and that's one thing I'm, I am grateful for with the the virtual teaching is having a resource like that to turn to yeah. if, if folks have it if they want to go over it yeah um yeah 
Yeah, I, I, the, the reading aspect of, of Gaelic teaching is kind of, um, how to put it, it can be complicated because there are many beautifully translated resources, but they're often beyond mm. beyond the abilities of folks who are starting out, folks in the first you know year yeah. or two of their journey. And I'm, I'm working to, to write books right. that are real stories, just in a, in a, in a clear way, written specifically for folk. Yeah. to to learn and that's been that's been really fun to read with people i love reading on my own I, I i'm an avid reader but to read with someone in another language can be a really bonding experience it's quite, mm -hmm. quite lovely that's something i recommend for for ci teachers if you haven't done it already you know nice. pick something that they someone can actually work you know work through and feel fairly good about reading and bad about it and just enjoy it yeah, yeah, and, and the good thing is, like you said, you can create them yourself, yourself, because the the struggle with resources in general is if if there's you know there you have like super interesting native resources, but uh, you know they're beyond your com your ability to understand. And on the other side, you have like children's stories or things of that nature. They're okay, but you know the story or the plot is. So, you know, sometimes it's really simple. So it's not that attractive in the long run, right? Yeah. But you can definitely do that. Like you can create wonderful and deep stories using, you know, relatively straightforward language, right? Absolutely. That's, that, that's like it the, doesn't need to be the, the best combination for me. Like really like, using simple words, but talking about deep topics or, or a deep story, and it can definitely be done, yeah. Absolutely, yeah, it's, it's, it's wonderful, I think. There's so many ways to create something really meaningful with folk through CI and yeah, it, it brings la language learning to life so much. It's really, yeah. it's unlike anything. Whole different, whole different experience when you compare that to, you know, <laughs> grammar and things like that. <laughs> Agreed. All right. So, yeah, thank you so much, Jason, for being on. Pleasure. And well, thanks for, for reaching out and, and inviting me. My really, it's a pleasure to, to chat with you. Yeah, like, I'm, I, I'm, I'm talking about it in every episode. I'm having so much fun with these mm -hmm. talks. And, and I think they're helpful for a lot of people as well. So it's mm. a win-win. Yeah. So win, 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 uh, all, all the way. <laughs> Nothing but wins. <laughs> all right. Okay. Thank you, Jason, again, and have a good day. Thank you very much. You too. Bye-bye.